people just entering the meeting room, uh, the waiting room at the moment. So once we've, we're ready, about four o'clock we'll start. So we're only a minute away, but they're being, everyone's coming in in dribs and drabs at the moment. How are you, Emma? Hi. Good, thank you. How are you? Good, I'm fine. Thanks so much. You've been here for ages. I know. Well, I suppose no one's seen anyone for ages. <laughs> that was the silly thing to say. I'm seeing you now. <laughs> Hi, Liz. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. How are you, Nicola? Very well, thank you. Yeah, very well. Good. Good to you. <laughs> I like your CIPD background, very posh. <laughs> That's what I said, I want it. <laughs> I'm so sorry, my Bev from uh, Thirsk. I don't have access to video at the moment, so. I can hear you. Okay. Hello. Liz. Okay, so it's four o'clock. I'm going to start. People are still coming in, but I'm very conscious that we only have an hour and we've got lots to get through. So um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name's Emma Plashak and I'm part of Team North for the CIPD. My role is the Members, Networks and Communities Manager uh, for the Northwest. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping up front from me. All attendees will be muted throughout the speaker session until the breakout. Um, please check your name on your Zoom account is changed if needed before um, breakout after the speakers. And if you lose connection at any point, please rejoin uh, by clicking on the link and we'll welcome you straight back into the session. We have some behind the scenes that's enabling that to happen. Any attendees that you want to have any direct questions, we have the chat box at the bottom of the screen. If you could pop them in there whilst the speakers are on, and we'll capture them and try to ask, um, answer all those questions. Um, the beginning of the session is recorded um, with the speakers and the Q&A, um, but upon exit from this session, uh, when you go out into the breakout rooms, they will not be recorded. So in, uh, once the speaker's Q&A is concluded, you'll be automatically placed in a breakout room. Um, where a facilitator will capture your insights and reflections and enable that discussion for you all. Um, once the network is concluded, we, you will be automatically returned back to this room and then we will just close and say thank you to the speakers. So enjoy the session and I'd like to uh, welcome Daphne. Emma. Um, hello, good afternoon everyone um, and welcome to today's session. It's great to have so many of you online today. Um, my name is Daphne Judy Green and I'm the head of CIPD Northern England. I hope you're all well and safe and enjoying um, the not so nice weather today that we have in the region. Um, so welcome to our very first um, virtual network for HR and L&D consultants. Um, to give you a little bit of context as to the reason why we wanted to deliver an event for you as a group, um, we were due to run our CIPD Northern annual conference in May um, and this is normally an opportunity for our members and customers from across the region to come together and unfortunately we we're unable to to run that event so we really wanted to create an opportunity for our members to come together and virtually connect and particularly and um, for our LND and HR consultants we're very mindful that this is a challenging time some of you um, are busier than ever and some of you you know will be um, we'll have uh, different kinds of challenges be because of uh, COVID. Um, you've probably also seen that we're running a social media campaign called hashtag uh, HR Together, um, where we've been collecting some amazing stories from the people profession. Um, and, you know, there's been some fantastic um, examples of how people have championed health and wellbeing, and how consultants are supporting their um, organisation. So we really wanted to take the opportunity to bring that campaign alive in our region and create an opportunity where you can come together, share, connect and, and hopefully build a, a community um, of practice. Um, and then lastly, I'd just like to say, you know, partly while we're doing these, is to say a big thank you to you as uh, CIPD members and customers in our region for, for all the great work um, that you're currently doing. We know it's a very, very difficult time 
um, and challenging time for, for our profession. So I'm delighted. Um, pardon, sorry about that. It's my home, home number, I do apologise. <laughs> um, so I'm delighted um, to have Ian and Kirsty with us today, two of our regional HR and L&D consultants who have given up their valuable time um, to support us and, and really talk through um, what COVID has meant for them personally and professionally. So, um, you know, it's a great opportunity, as I said, to, to share. Um, they've also written some blogs, which we'll be sharing um, after the event. Um, so look, um, I'm going to quickly um, get started and I'm going to introduce our very first speaker. Um, Ian Pettigrew is an LD consultant and he's from Kingfisher Coaching and I'm going to hand over um, to Ian to talk to us um, about his experiences. Over to you Ian. Oh, brilliant, thanks Daphne. It's lovely to be part of this and it's lovely to see so many familiar and smiling faces on the call as well. It's, uh, it's like being at a party with lots of friends there. So, um, but enough of that. So what do we do? Um, King Fisher Coaching is a small business and we provide leadership development and coaching, um, work across lots of different sectors, spend about half our time working in the NHS um, and with healthcare in the Middle East. Um, work with some of the big banks, work with um, a couple of pharmaceutical companies, um, real sort of um, variety of clients and deep expertise is around strengths and resilience. So how has COVID-19 impacted us? Um, really interesting. Um, initially, not at all. So I was really fortunate to be um, on holiday in Cornwall just sort of before um, lockdown happened. I'd taken my laptop um, deliberately because I thought things were going to happen and change. So I ordered some, you know, ordered myself a better webcam, microphone stand and pop filter and things like that um, and came back feeling sort of really well prepared. And initially nothing changed. Um, everything moved to online, to virtual, obviously, but work initially was really similar. And then suddenly got caught out because went through a sudden phase of loads of things getting deferred. So I think I had one morning in particular when I woke up. And when I woke up, you know, my schedule was normal um, and I'm consistently busy. I'm fortunate um, and, you know, my diary looked as normal. And then suddenly by the end of that three or four hours, absolutely tons of work had disappeared out my schedule, um, mostly being deferred either indefinitely um, or some of it, you know, rebooked into December and I think March next year and things like that. And I'm not used to having an empty schedule. So I did have a real sort of <gasps> moment. Um, but then phase three has been um, works coming back, um, all the work's been getting rebooked, um, been winning some new clients and some new work with existing clients. One thing that surprised me though is that even sort of months down the track, how much of the work is still confirmed to be online only. Um, so I've got things in December um, where we're de delivering it virtually, um, it's not face to face. So it's not been without challenges, but for me, I guess, some of the clients I'm working with, you know, I'm working with A&E consultants, I'm working with frontline care workers. Um, I've had an easy time compared to my clients. So it's certainly sort of put it into perspective for me. But the main challenges for me, um, one has been holding my nerve. Um, you know, Kingfisher Coaching is a two-person business. I don't think I mentioned who the other person is. It's a business manager that organizes everything, and we happen to be married to each other. Um, so it's my wife and I that work together. So we have no independent income. You know, this is not a hobby. It's not a side hustle. Um, for both of us, it's all eggs in one basket. This is what, you know, earns the money and pays the mortgage. So I'm I need to be at my best to help my clients. So not worrying about things, you know, and, and making sure that I stuck to my guns and, and, and stuck to what I know has been really important. Um, like everybody, I've had the occasional wobble um, and there's been occasions where I've struggled, particularly with concentration, you know, we're being quite sort of um, distracted by things that are going on. Um, but I know it's really popular to say we're all in this together. 
Um, but I also don't think that's the reality of the situation. And I count myself in the fortunate category. You know, I've, I've had, in many respects, a really easy time um, of this. feel a bit guilty saying that, but that's the, uh, the honest truth. Um, work has been less busy. But also, I'm normally, you know, I live in Manchester or just south of Manchester. I'm normally traveling quite a bit. I'm in London two days a week. Um, just traveling less has made life a lot easier and reminded me how much of my time I, I normally spend sort of in hotels and, and trains. So there's been real opportunities. Um, I've used my extra time to, to really put an, an emphasis on self-development, um, but particularly to practice what I preach. And I don't know whether it's just me and I'm making myself look stupid here, but that's often a bit of a... Um, a blind spot for me that I don't always practice what I preach. I'm busy helping other people and I, I don't always put it into practice myself. Um, done a lot of research. Um, I'm one of those irritating people that I'm going to finish lockdown a stone lighter than when I started. Um, a lot fitter, you know, being able to do a lot more exercise um, and had more downtime. But there's also been a real opportunity in that. Now I'm finding that I'm picking up work in lots of different geographies. Um, you know, I've always worked in a few different countries, but now there's no boundaries to work. Um, I'm picking up work in lots of different places. And I'm really proud of my clients um, and I'm proud of the work I do. Um, I'm proud of the opportunities I get to help people. You know, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, making a difference. So, I've been proud to continue to uh, to have opportunities to do that. Um, I'm on one of the boards of Hope for Justice, a global anti-slavery charity, and I am beyond proud um, of the work that our staff um, and supporters are doing. Um, I've been delighted that a host connecting HR Manchester, a very informal get together for HR people. We normally meet four times a year. Um, I've been really pleased to be able to do that every Thursday night to be able to be a place for people. Um, I'm proud of my family. In fact, hang on, can I correct that slightly? I'm proud of most of my family and the way they've responded. Um, probably won't go into that in any more detail. Um, and I'm actually proud of myself. Um, one of the things I, I tend not to say in public is that a big motivation for me. Um, my mum, who died a couple of years ago, would always say, you can't do better than your best. You know, and my mum, even in all sorts of situations, would be really proud of me. And one of my drivers is always, would I be making my mum proud? Um, and actually, I'm, I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, I, I would be. So I'm really proud of that. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm making better use of my time. I'm making some time to do things that previously I wasn't prioritising. Um, I shouldn't ne have needed a pandemic to actually learn that, but here you go, better late than never. Um, I've learned how much time commuting and travel takes. I'd have said I was doing a lot of work online before, and I was, um, but I've been able to push even more work um, online. Um, it's also reminded me a lot of the work I do is around resilience um, and I tend to be quite reticent about sort of promoting that, but, um, you know, it's really reminded me about how much of a need uh, there is for that work. And again, being honest, I think I've ridden my luck a little bit. You know, I've come through this okay. I've come through this with enough work to keep going. That was definitely by accident rather than by design. Um, and that's something I'll be thinking about in future. Um, if I looked at my portfolio and thought, you know, how resilient is my portfolio of client work to cope with things? Um, the answer was, yes, it was, but only accidentally. And there's a few things I do differently um, early on in the, the sort of lockdown. I think I was just waiting for this to finish and get back to normal. And I don't think we are getting back to normal. So, you know, I've changed my perspective and mindset. But one thing I do regret is that, you know, I, I tend not to do much marketing. And I think that selling and marketing kind of is in, is in conflict with good L&D practice um, in some respects where, you know, I want people to know what it is they want. And if I'm the best fit, engage with me. Um, and actually, I wish I'd sort of shared more and written more content. 
um, to help people. And I've held back on it because it felt a bit like marketing for me. So I was quite reticent. So I'm going to close in just a moment, but um, three tips we were asked. Top tips for the months ahead. I'm not going to be arrogant enough to give top tips for any of you. So adapt them as you feel fit. You do you. But my top tips for me, um, one is practice what I preach. That's really important. Secondly is be really intentional in using time and not to waste the crisis. Um, I'm taking opportunities of this. And thirdly, we're not all in this together. You know, I'm not going to make assumptions about what people have gone through. Some people have really struggled. So I am going to make more of an effort to be compassionate to other people and to be equally compassionate to myself. And with one second left, thank you. Okay, can people hear me? Okay, thank you so much, Ian. That was um, a lovely story and, and, and thank you for being so honest and open. Um, so I'm gonna quickly move on um, to our next, next speaker. And uh, just by the way, I'm seeing lots of chat and questions coming through. So continue to, to bring those through and we'll ask as many as we possibly can um, in the Q&A and then we'll, we'll obviously take those into the facilitated sessions as well. So thanks again Ian. Um, so moving on to our next speaker, Kirsty Robinson um, is a HR consultant from Cooked the Mustard HR. Welcome Kirsty, and I'll hand over to you. Great, I'm off mute now. <laughs> Hello everybody, it's lovely to be here and it's great to see so many faces, some familiar, some not familiar so hello if it's the first time you've ever met me before um, as Daphne said um, I um, am the founder and owner of Cut the Mustard HR which is a HR consultancy based in York and we provide HR services to businesses of all shapes and sizes so um, my smallest client is a team of eight and I work with larger organizations um, such as the NHS um, as part of this, I was asked to talk about how the coronavirus pandemic has impacted my organisation. And um, I think for this, I'd like to take us back 12 years um, to September the 15th, 2008, which may resonate with some of you, um, to a time when I was actually stood in the middle of Canary Wharf. And there was a huge commotion going on outside the Lehman Brother offices. And I was thinking, what the hell is going on right here, right now? Obviously, I hadn't seen the papers. I hadn't looked at my phone at that point. Something was obviously happening. But ironically, that was the day that I was stood outside of a bank when I had just been offered the best HR job ever. And it was that situation that kind of got me into the mindset and taught me that whatever the crisis, never assume that the impact on everyone is the same. I never believe that what you're being told in the press is happening to everybody around you right now. So moving forward to 2020 in this pandemic, um, I think this realization has never been closer to the truth, to be honest. Um, I've found that with my clients, you know, not every business or individual has been impacted the same and not even to the same degree. And we've definitely got a few clients of our own that have given us some real surprises about the situation that they're in. And some have been a complete anomaly to what we've been told in the press. So I've been asked to talk about what my experience was and has been in particular. And if I was going to summarize it, I would say that it was like being that, in that boiling frog fable. You know the one when the temperature changes when the frog is in the water and it gets hotter and hotter? Well, I think that frog was actually me. And... Um, just before lockdown, just like Ian, I was fortunate, fortunate to have a quick holiday um, before it all kind of kicked off. And um, I went on holiday with my family to the French Alps. And whilst enjoying what I now realise to be my last week of final freedom, the pressure in the UK was really mounting. And um, interestingly, we spent our evenings with a couple, one of which was an airline pilot for a major airline and the other a doctor. So you can imagine the types of conversations we were having in the background um, about COVID-19. And um, admittedly, 
it was from the airline pilot that I'd ever heard of the word furlough. And I don't know if any of you heard of it before this time, but I definitely hadn't. It was a big hole in my HR knowledge. And then whilst in France, the impact on my business had already started, yet I was still the frog, sat back enjoying the temperature of the water and was feeling quite happy turning a blind eye to what was going on in the UK. A number of face-to-face -face events got cancelled whilst I was away um, and some of them had moved to digital so I was using Zoom and go to training. Um, but it was then that I was starting to feel like this is getting a little bit worrying now because my workload is changing. Things, people are pulling out and I was still making the decision to stay in that lovely hot water and probably drink, drink a few van shows at the time as well. So it hadn't really hit at that point. Now it was the day that we left France um, that the, was a day actually that France went into lockdown so we woke up in the morning and there were police and military everywhere and then this is when the realization kicked in um, we were lucky to get back but once we got to the airport there were families coming on holiday to France who were being turned away and they were absolutely devastated and I just felt so thankful that we'd managed to get through that point but I then knew that this was big, it was, and I needed to embrace it, and I needed to take a leap out of that water and actually do something about it. So back in the UK, um, things have been different, and I think that um, Cut the Mustard, and myself in particular, have been impacted in five key ways. Firstly, I don't know if any of you have children, but if you do at the moment, I really empathize with you. I have two children, I have a husband at home, and we're all trying to make everything work. Um, I teach the kids during the day in between calls and anything that requires any amount of headspace I have to do from 8 p.m. onwards and I am exhausted yeah I've discovered that um, kids don't respond well to coaching and that probably is my coaching because I am so exhausted but they don't respond well to it at all um, the second thing I've noticed is that it's amazing how many of my friends and family have suddenly come out the woodwork to say hello and check on my well-being but actually it's to get HR advice. <laughs> and before they never really knew what I did, but they do now. And you know, I'm getting loads of questions like, can my business really do that when it comes to things like unilateral pay cuts and enforced annual leave and things like that. So they suddenly realize how important my job is, which is really, really exciting. Um, thirdly, um, I'm saying a lot of words that I don't normally say. So top of the charts has to be, um, it all depends. What does the contract say? It's one thing I'm saying very often. Um, another one is, um, and what is your appetite for risk? And the third one has to be, shh, mummy's on a call, which happens all the time. Um, fourthly, the type of work we're doing has changed. It's kind of, it kind of dipped and then it kind of got really, really busy as people were asking for help in terms of making things like furlough decisions, changing contracts implementing the COVID secure guidance, all of that's become more important now and tends to be kind of flavor of the month. And finally, I would say that once the flurry of cancellations had bypassed, I've seen a real shift in perception and an increased appetite for digital learning and HR as a means of keeping the workforce engaged and connected during this um, difficult time. And the interesting bit about HR is that a few months ago, thinking about kind of the bread and butter HR, um, if I made the suggestion to hold a disciplinary or grievance meeting via Zoom, it would have been laughed at. Whereas now it feels like it's just commonplace. Um, so that's been a big change to the business. So in terms of kind of my biggest challenge, I would say it has to be trying to manage work with home life. You know, if somebody told me that I'd be doing this months ago, I just would have laughed. I really would and just thought it was impossible. It doesn't mean I'm doing it great. I feel like I'm, I'm managing, but I don't think I'm a shining star. I think what's helped is just lowering my expectations, deciding what's important. So now actually the takeouts and microwave food, they're acceptable in our house. And you know, the, the schooling standards, they're important to me. The work's important to me. The state of the house, that's below standard. I've just had to live with it. Biggest opportunity, I would definitely say, moving into the space of digital HR and learning. I think, cut the mustard, I thought we were always ahead of the game. We're always trying to pursue this with our clients. Some embrace it a lot more than others. I think the pandemic has really forced organizations to take that kind of digital leap 
and move the transition kind of forward by a few years. Um, and I also think it can provide invaluable support at this time for furloughed and, um, and um, working staff to keep them engaged. And I think for us as a business, the opportunity is that there are no limits now. You know, now we're in this space. You know, our clients don't have to be local. They don't have to be in the UK. They could be global, which I think is really exciting. So finally, my top three tips for the time ahead. And to be honest, I'm not an expert here. So these are the things that have worked for me and I, you know, and are working for my clients. So take them and do, do as you wish. But I just remember on my flight home from France, when the, when the air attendant on my flight was saying about putting my mask on first before my children, et cetera, I think the first one has to be look after yourself to avoid burnout. I think, um, you know, very aligned with what Ian was saying about practicing what I preach. And I don't think I did that straight away. I think it's sunk in a little bit later for me. And it was on, I was on a meeting the other day, walking through the fields, because we live in the countryside, and my client said to me, you know, where are you, Kirsty? Because he could hear the wind in my phone. I said, oh, I'm just walking along the fields. He said, I should do more than that. And I thought, you know what? If that's made a difference, I'm really pleased. Um, the second one is, is about looking after my clients. And it's not just by doing the doing, because for, for us, there's been a lot of kind of employee relations type work. It's more about challenging them to think long time. I think this is going to be the biggest test of businesses about whether they really do follow their values. A big test to see whether they're going to really demonstrate them in this time. And if they do, this will be remembered. And I just believe that actually one day the tide will turn and if businesses have treated people really well, created a community of followers, that one day when those tides do turn, those people may want to return. And I think we can really add value in this space. And I think finally, finally, it has to be look after each other by reaching out to others and making connections with your community. Um, I think we spend a lot of time getting our clients to stay connected with people that are furloughed and staying connected with their staff. But actually, at times like these, I know that being connected to a group gives me a greater tolerance to uncertainty and helps me better cope with this kind of prolonged disruption. And I've also, from being part of um, working with my, my peer group and my community, I've actually man managed to find a bit of joy in the experience too. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsty. That again, a wonderful story and so honest and open. Um, and I don't know what you won't have seen all the chat going on while you were speaking, but there's lots of reflections, particularly on childcare and children, and um, the importance of self care. I think has come come out from from you and Ian, you know, incredibly important that we all look after ourselves in, in this new digital world and different world. Um, so that there are some questions and I've asked Emma to kind of pull out some questions which I'll um, pose to you both actually. We'll spend about 10 minutes and I'll explain a little bit about the facilitated um, sessions. So one of the questions, and forgive me, I don't know who it is now because all, all the chat's moving so quickly. And by the way, it's great to see everybody just networking and, and sharing on the chat. Um, so one of the questions um, was, what's been the most um, challenging thing about moving, the most challenging and easy thing about moving to this new digital world? Kirsty, you touched on it, so did you, Ian, but you know, and, and I guess in terms of the future as well, because we're in it right now, but what, what does that mean in the future? So what's been challenging and easy, and as you kind of think ahead as well? Ian, do you want to take that first? He's still on mute. <laughs> That's it. Host wasn't oh. allowing me to unmute. I was like desperately clicking on unmute. <laughs> um, so um, I'm um, OK. I, I, <laughs> I take this stuff really seriously, but I take everything really seriously. So I tend I, I've always I've always read a lot about digital pedagogy you know, about, and there's some great resources, particularly from some of the universities. Um, there's some really great groups. There's some really good materials. Um, so, and, and some, particularly some professors and lecturers have been sort of good at sharing stuff online. So I've relied on a lot of that. Um, but I think delivering a good experience online 
gets down to a lot of the same principles as we would do face to face as well. So making it a really engaging experience, being really intentional. Um, there's some things that I don't think always happen online though, that, um, you know, sometimes we don't take enough of breaks online, you know, so you can be in a, a session for three hours on zoom, you know, where people don't think about natural breaks. We wouldn't tend to do that in a room. Um, so we don't have to rely on people muting themselves and stopping video to nip off to the loo, you know, so building breaks. So be intentional. Um, but you can, um, I had a, a workshop I ran for a university a little while ago, um, just in lockdown and they were really worried. It was a resilience workshop. There was a huge need for it. They were really cynical about whether we could make it work effectively um, online. So I deliberately got feedback and shared it afterwards. And the feedback was, this has been brilliant. This has been really engaging. It's been just as engaging as it would be if we were in the room. Um, one person said it was the most engaging workshop they've ever been to. Well, obviously, they've been to some really badly designed face-to-face -face workshops in order for, uh, for, for that to happen. Um, so, yeah, be intentional about it. Um, hardest bit, don't think there's been anything difficult about it. Oh, apart from technology, it depends what you use. Um, a lot of um, clients had previously banned Zoom. So operating within Teams and things, you know, the challenge of breakout rooms. But Zoom seems to be coming back on the agenda now, you know, with having made massive security uh, things. What's been easy about it? Um, I have got a good microphone, I've got a good quality webcam that's mounted just above a big screen. You know, what used to be hard was doing it on my laptop, propping it up on a stack of books. Um, so big screen, big monitor, good microphone. I use headphones if the audio is a bit, uh, a, a bit ropey. And then on occasions, I've been doing some work for university recently where we've used a co-facilitator. Um, and to have somebody else managing the breakout rooms in Zoom with a big group, I think as we're amply displaying today, can be really powerful. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Ian. Thank you. Kirsty? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we, we, like I said in, 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 the, in, the, in the speech, um, it, we're very much into digital anyway, but obviously this has accelerated everything. I think, the, just very similar to Ian, some of the challenges have been helping clients to see that these things can be done digitally and they can be done in some cases just as well as face to face and just getting them to see that so it has taken some effort and some influencing and again you know when we've had good experiences i'm very keen to share those around to say look we can do this this can happen you don't have to stop everything so that's definitely one thing um I think, you know, personal challenge, we live in the country, our internet access can be shocking. So sometimes we're hanging out of windows and roofs and things, but so that, that's just a personal thing that's it's been a bit of a nightmare. Um, we tend to use Zoom, go to training is another one that's really quite useful to use. Um, and, you know, we're learning as we go along. We've also got a green screen as well. So that's, that's helped in delivering some of our stuff and looks quite, you know, quite professional. Um, and I think as well in terms of skills, I mean, I've been secretly trying to learn, go into new tools and just give them a go and using family members to have a bit of a practice to build my confidence on just try out new stuff. And I think at the moment with, th with this all being new for a lot of people, don't be afraid to try out new stuff. Yeah. And do it in a safe environment if you have to. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, I think we've got time maybe for one more question, but it would probably have to be relatively quick answers. <laughs> um, so. Um, one other question um, to you both, it's probably more of a summary question, but how can the HR world reshape the new abnormal um, and how can we make the future of workplaces better? Um, so that's, uh, that's a question from, from one of our attendees. Um, do, you, do you want to take it, Ian? Uh, not particularly, because it's a really hard question, and it's like particularly when you say just answer it quickly as well. And given that we're recorded, the only thing I can guarantee, predictions, future work, I'll be wrong. Um, right, I, I, um, I hope, okay, let me go with what I hope. Yeah. So I am an eternal optimist, um, and I was saying on a session this morning that, you know, hope is different from optimism. Uh, one of the, the Shane Lopez definition of hope is that, it's optimism, a belief that the future is going to be better than it is now. And it's a belief that we can do something to make that so. Okay, so hope. What do I hope for? 
Um, I hope we are going to move towards a kinder, compassionate world where we get to do what we're there to do. Um, but people are trusted. And as a result of being trusted, people are empowered and people can be them. You know, they can still do good stuff, um, but, you know, maintain really good well-being at the same time. Um, how are we going to get there? I think, sorry, this is dead easy to say, isn't it? I think we need to be braver and bolder. Um, I think disrupting what you do is often one of the hardest things to do. You know, it, it's why an incumbent often gets disrupted by another player. You know, it's why Kodak got disrupted by Instagram, you know, and other companies. Um, but there are things you can do uh, and, you know, to try experiments. So I think we need to be braver. We need to take some big risks. And for some things that we think, oh, wow, sure, we could never get away with doing that. But if we did, it'd be brilliant. Do a little experiment to see whether it works. Thank you, um, Ian. I, Kirsty, I'm just conscious of time and moving I, in. So I didn't answer it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a very good job for answering the both of you. Um, uh, so um, we're going to um, break out now into um, our facilitated sessions. And because there's such a large group, we are joined by um, our lovely Northern Branch Chair and Committee member. So um, you're all there. Could you just wave, please? <laughs> Um, there's, there's, there's lots on the call um, and what we wanted to do I think I, I kind of set the context up front is that yeah partly this was about sharing stories but it was partly about helping you to create a network and share so there's been fantastic networking and sharing um, in the chat already and it was an opportunity to bring that into smaller groups um, and um, those will be facilitated as well just to help to, to kind of gather some um, insight um, but yeah that's that's the um, next uh, part of the session so we're going to break you into groups um, i'm not entirely sure of the final numbers on the call um but we will move into that and then we'll we'll come back in at about um 4 59 and then um we'll we'll bring you back um into the session um emma was there anything else from a housekeeping perspective that i've missed out on um just just be kind to each other in the rooms it won't be yes. recorded um and um enjoy we'll enjoy. see you soon Yes, enjoy. We'll see. You. We'll see. You. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so this is the final close. We hope you found that um, helpful. We're really sorry to cut it short. Um, it will be really helpful if you can kind of give us feedback um, and tell us um, whether or not the networking part of the session needs to be longer. Um, but I'm going to close very quickly um, and say a huge thank you. Um, to Ian and Kirsty for um, sharing their stories with us today. Um, I think you'll agree um, that we're really honest and open and um, um, I'm incredibly um, happy that they were able to do that um, for us. So if you can give um, Ian and Kirsty a virtual clap, um, that would be lovely, thank you. Um, and just a quick reminder on a few things. So um, you'll see the slide ahead. We, we've got um, up and coming events over the next um, month. Our next HR and L&D consultants event is on the 24th of June. Um, so places are booking up relatively quickly. So if you'd like to join us again um, and network with others in your peers, um, please book on um, Eventbrite. Um, we've got one um, speaker confirmed, which is Alistair Swindlehurst, um, HR consultant from our region. I believe he's on um, line today um, and soon we'll have our L&D um, speaker um, com confirmed. So we look forward um, to seeing you there. So um, uh, lastly, just a couple of reminders. Um, if you aren't using the CIPD Coronavirus Hub, I would suggest that you do. It's open for everybody. Um, we've been doing a huge amount of work on that. It's updated daily. And um, we've also launched the health and wellbeing line um, uh, for our members. So again, please, as independent consultants, that is um, a member service for you and we, we'd love you um, to use it. So uh, I think that's all I'm going to say. Please fill out your feedback form. We really do want to hear what you thought about the session and how we can improve. We're all ears um, and we look forward to seeing you at um, the Future Network. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening.